about you. So I'm just going to introduce John. So welcome everyone to our last design roast. We've had a really good term this term. We've had some really exciting and interesting talks about <coughs> diversity and inclusivity. And we've obviously saved the best for last. <laughs> so um, Jean um, will come talk to you guys about uh, design from a user's perspective and thinking about how we can design in relation to people. And I'll let you he, him introduce himself more thoroughly than that. Great. Well, thanks so much. Uh, I've been really excited about coming here. It reminds me of uh, when I was your age and I've been wanting to go back to design school. Uh, so it, it, it's, I'm really excited about it. I've got a lot I'd like to tell you. I'm going to try and be very efficient. Um, and so I hope we get to the discussion at the end and we have a lot, more, lot of time for that. Um, so very quickly, my full name is Jean-François. Uh, I'm a UX designer at a company called The App Business. Um, the App Business is a place, ooh, uh, is a place that does um, apps and websites. Uh, for, sorry, for example, I've worked for a company called Dunhamby. I've done a bit of work for, if you have the, um, you know, the, the train, card, train, train card app on your phone, I've done that. Some of it, some of it is really bad. Might, might be my bit, might not be my bit. Uh, oh gosh, I'm recorded. <laughs> uh, a few other things like uh, Unilever, The Telegraph, and uh, Tesco, and The Met Office, a few, few things like that. Um, so my job there is to be a UX designer. The first thing I'd like to do is first tell you a tiny bit about me, and also why I love my job. But then very quickly get into the main thing I want to talk to you about, which is how to design things that help people out. And then go to a discussion. So what I'd like to do is go pretty quickly through the first bit and the second bit. And I'm sure you'll have lots of questions as we go through. Um, I'd like you to try and keep the questions for the end so it helps me get there. But if at any point something is just not clear, please do raise your hand. That's my job to, to make sure it's clear and it will help me learn. Sounds good for everyone? Great. So very quickly about me, uh, and in particular my journey so far. So I started in business school in France, and when I was in business school, all I was really thinking about was going to art school. Um, but instead of that, I was like, I don't want to waste my business school money. So I went instead to advertising, and I did um, a strategy and research in advertising. I was making ads for Apple at the time. And then I was made redundant from another advertising agency, and so I was hired for free as an intern in a company called The App Business and had no idea what I was doing. And then at that time I discovered UX, user experience design. Didn't, it existed but we were not doing it very much. A lot of the designers came from a graphic design background but I started to uh, kind of do start UX at my company. Initially, I was, I was doing nothing relating to design. I was doing strategy, and I'll say in a moment what that means, and also doing a lot of research. Then, later on, I moved to, be on, to become a, a hands-on UX designer, because it's a lot more fun, I think, and personally, it's personal opinion. And um, I also learned to code to do functional prototyping because it's a lot more fun, I think, if you do all these things together, I believe. And more recently, I'm really focusing on inclusive design. So that's designing so that uh, anyone can use it regardless of um, any impairment or where they live and their bandwidth and how fast the internet is. And, and part of this, I'm learning more about accessibility. Uh, my opinion is that design, in particular UX design, is the best job in the world, but there is a catch. You have to make it so. And that's been my, my obsession, really. Um, so what I'd like to tell you about is a few, a few of the frustrations that I hear the most from designers around me. And I've developed some in immune system. I'm actually not touched by these things anymore. And I'm going to tell you at the, in the rest of this talk, how to navigate all these situations. So if they happen to you, and I imagine they will happen to you if you do anything like digital design, how to navigate all these pain points. Um, so you might hear your client say, please design this feature. So for example, uh, the last one for me was, please design a NAP marketplace. You go and do it. What does it look like? Please show me. Um, you got to do it by Tuesday because the developers need something to work on and we can't allow developers to not have work because they're so expensive. That's a bit frustrating for some of us. 
Or another one might be, another frustration might be a client saying, can you just quickly mock a few screens up? Like, and that's kind of really not acknowledging that you actually might need to think about it or try things out to do a bit of research. So that's, I want to show that to my colleagues, they go, Ugh, uh, for me as well. Uh, oh, surely it shouldn't take long. Or another one would, might be, this is more this is other designers telling me, oh, we've been working on this uh, website or this app for six months, but really don't understand users' needs. It feels like we're designing in the dark. But the client doesn't want to do research. So again, I'm going to tell you some things that if you master them, that's not going to happen to you. And lastly, a designer might say, oh, we never get a clear brief from the client. It's always so confused. And then they always change their mind. I'm going to show you how you can take control of that situation. So very quickly, here's how I've been making my job very exciting, very meaningful. I've been very afraid in my career of being bored. So you'll see I've deployed lots of, lots of energy to make it interesting. So the first thing is, that was my background, and I recommend that to any designer become good at strategy, and you understand what I mean by this in a moment. If you do this, it means that you can take ownership of, um, you can take ownership of any ask, any brief the client gives you. It'll be probably not very good when it's given to you, but you can make it better. Second, become really good at user research and user testing because you, it needs to happen if you want to design anything good from the point of view of user experience. And often clients don't want to do it. But if you can show them how it can be done super quickly and super effectively, you'll be able to do it as much as you'd like. Lastly, it, uh, ne next, for me, it was really helpful to become good at prototyping and to learn code because then it means that the whole design process becomes a bit more like a scientific approach you know, instead of someone saying, I like this, another person saying, I like that, and me having to design some sort of bastardized version of both these things, then I could say, oh, great, we have two hypotheses here. Um, I don't know which one will work better, but we can test it. We can do a rigorous user test because we've got a functional prototype very quickly. Um, this is something that really helped me. Um, a lot of the people around me in my agency, they straight away design things that look great. And when I try to do this, I can kind of doing it, but I always realize three weeks later or three months later that I've not really thought it through. So what I do is I focus on what the thing is first and how it works first, and only later I focus about aesthetics or I try to get someone else to worry about it for me. Um, because otherwise, I, don't, I think it's too hard. As soon as we show something that's like high fidelity designs, I find that my brain just gets obsessed with how it looks, and my client's brains is the same, and we can't really have good conversations about, is that even the right thing, or are we making assumptions? Is this the right experience? And lastly, something I've, I've realized only too late is, I'm trying to ask myself every time I design something, who is it that this particular design is excluding? It could be people who only use keyboards to navigate the internet, or it could be people who don't have perfect eyesight. Who is it that I'm excluding here? And how can I solve that? And this is how I'm making, I'm finding meaning in my work. I also want to share with you lots of books that gave me lots of joy, but I don't have time to talk about them. You'll find them at the end afterwards. And now that's my little presentation. I'd like to tell you about one of the tricks I've learned in my career. It's about how to design things that help people out. And as I do this, I'd like to tell you, this is a very broad title. Um, I'm sure different people here have different expectations of what it is that might be covering. Um, the, the theme, one of the themes of this uh, lecture series is inclusivity and something I've been very, very passionate about, but quite recently. Uh, I wish today I could talk to you about how to do inclusive design and accessibility, but I'm not yet an expert in that. Instead, I'm going to show you another method that's also going to help you design things that really help, help you understand users' needs really deeply and really make sure that whatever you design is really going to solve users' needs. It's going to be equally helpful to you. My hope is that I'll be able to come back another day when I really have sourced inclusive design and tell you about it. So here's a question. What does it take to make a product or a service that is actually really useful to people? I wish I could let you answer, but I don't have the time. I need to go through it. So I'll tell you what it takes. It takes three things. The first thing is that you really need to understand 
uh, what, what your potential users' uh, unmet needs are. Like, what is it that they are struggling with and that there isn't anything out there that, solve, that, that solves it for them? You need to understand that. Second, you need to really focus on the best opportunities because there's so many things you could do. You need to know where to focus and you need to convince your team about where to focus. And lastly, you need a, 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 a design process that's rigorous and that's also lean. And by lean, I mean uh, you've got to be able to do things very quickly and test them with people. Like, for example, do lots of paper prototyping as opposed to going straight into involving 10 engineers. So that you can test your ideas and test your assumptions. Now, this is where it should be. But from my experience, the number one reason that designers and developers fail to create stuff that are actually useful to people is that we, in industry, focus too much on feature ideas. And as we do that, we lose sight of what people are actually trying to achieve. And let me show you a few examples. This is what we call a product backlog. It's a list of the features that our client requires us to do. And as you can see, well, it's all basically expressed as a feature. It's got you know, analytics and hearts and hibs on the timeline and video to article. It's all expressed in terms of what's the solution, what's the feature. And most of the time it will be coming from the client or someone at the client organization who tells you, oh, this app has got to have this, it's got to have that, it's got to have that. When, you, when this is the main tool that you use, then we definitely focus too much on feature ideas. And there's nothing here about what is it people are trying to achieve. And so here's a, what we call a morning uh, ceremony that we have when we make uh, apps and, software and, and websites. It's called a scrum meeting or stand-up. And we talk about, as a whole team, what we're going to do about it in the day. So you have designers, developers, uh, testers, and project leads, and all that. And everyone is talking about the task they're going to complete today and the features they're going to build. But it's very easy for everyone here to lose sight of what is it the users are going to be want to achieve. Because we don't really talk about them day to day. And the result of that is that you end up with you know, big companies like MNS spending lots of monies developing crazy features that are really impressive but actually completely useless. People are not using them because it's actually not helping someone achieve an outcome that they really want to achieve right in, in a situation they're in. So what we need to solve this is that we need to put people's real struggles and circumstances and also the, the outcomes that they're hoping for at the center of every conversation when we make something as opposed to feature ideas. Now, there are a few different ways you could do this. My favorite method for doing this is called jobs to be done. And this is what I'm going to tell you about now. I'm going to tell you two I'm going to tell you about this method in two simple ideas, and I'm going to tell you three tips about how to apply it. So, what is jobs to be done? The first idea is that people don't actually want, people don't actually want products or services. Instead, what people want is progress. And that's a bit fluffy. Let me tell you exactly what I mean. What actually is happening is that people are in some specific circumstances and they're struggling in these circumstances. And they're thinking about how they like things to turn out. They're thinking about the outcomes that they like to achieve. And what they really want is not a product or a feature. What they really want is a way to get from here to that. What they really feel is the current frustrations, or the current pain they're feeling, or the helplessness they're feeling, and they have a dream about, oh, I wish things were like this. And that's what they're really willing to pay money to achieve or invest effort to achieve. And they'll be looking for ways to go from here to that. And if you understand this, then you can design much better stuff. Let me give you a few examples. So if you hear me say, I really want coffee, it's kind of true, but it's really not getting to the bottom of things. But let me give you a more concrete example of what's actually happening. This is me. I work very often. 
I didn't sleep very well, and I'm struggling to focus on my work. I'm starting to feel quite shit about myself. I'm starting to feel quite... I really struggle to get motivated to get things done because sometimes the work is boring. And what I really want to achieve, the outcomes that I really want are I manage to focus on my work so that it's done to decent standards by 6 p.m. so that I don't get stressed over the weekend or the, I, don't, I don't have to work late tonight. These are outcomes, they're not features. Now how could I, when I'm in this situation over there, how could I achieve this? Well, a few different options, things I've used in the past. I've used coffee. I've used having a nap sometimes in the toilet. Uh, when I couldn't have a nap, I would meditate in the toilet. But most commonly, I would procrastinate or try and delegate. So these are all the things that, all the things that I use to go from here to here. It's not a coffee that I want. I'm struggling like this, and I want that. Let me give you another example. So say you are at, you are at uh, B&Q um, and you hear someone say, I need a lawnmower. I really want a lawnmower. Well, that's probably true, but again, it's not getting to the bottom of things. And if you want to design a better lawnmower or actually understand what people are willing to buy, you, need, you want to get to the bottom of things. Again, I'll give you one real life anecdote. Um, so something that's happened to me is I look at the garden through the window and I know I should have mown the lawn four weeks ago. Um, and it's a recurring arg argument with my partner that I should have mown the lawn four weeks ago and it always happens like this because I'm always late to mow it. And we both feel slightly depressed when we look at the garden because it's not making us feel good. And I feel guilty. What I really want to achieve is I want the garden to be pleasant when I'm in it, or when I look at it. I want my partner not to hassle me. Hello, Emily. I want us to be happy together. And, and if I'm really honest, what I really want is, I want to have time to whatever, the, whatever I want, really. So that's what I can tell you. The, you can see where the energy is. It, I don't really care about the loan more yet, but I, can re, I really do care about that. Now, how could we go from here to here? Well, a few different strategies. I could get a, lo a new lawnmower. I could get some artificial grass. I could get a stone garden. Uh, we could get a higher gardener. We could do nothing. That's really what, what I've been doing most. It doesn't really solve it, but that's what I've been using. Um, so yeah, so this is the first idea about, about jobs to be done. Now, here's the second idea now, and this is the important one. This is the most important thing I'd like you to remember today. If you focus on product features, that's going to make really hard. It's going to make it really hard to design something that, that's better for people. But instead of that, if you understand the situation of struggle that customers are in, and the outcomes that they want to achieve, then that makes, that makes it a lot easier to, for, for you to design better stuff. By the way, I use the word customer. It's how we normally talk in my company. Uh, you can think of a user or someone, a, a person. So if you understand the situation of struggle that people are in and the outcomes they, they're hoping to achieve, then you can redesign something better for them. And again, so concretely, it's a process. It's got four steps. And this is my design process, by the way. I get paid a lot to do these things just because people normally don't follow this design process. And it's, it's made my life way easier. So, step number one is understanding what are our customers' specific circumstances and, and struggles. Second step is what outcomes are we trying to achieve? Oh, sorry, what outcomes are they trying to achieve? Their situation of struggle, outcomes that they are trying to achieve. That's the second step. The third step is what solutions are they currently using or are they currently considering to go from here to here? And it could be another app that they use. It could be another, it's something that's not an app at all. It could be something, to, another strategy that they use. And the fourth step is to ask ourselves, can we make that quicker and easier? This is not a subjective question. This is something you can test. So this is the process. I want to give you a quick example. I just want to check the time. 
Um, I've spoken 20 minutes, so I'm going to go a bit faster. Um, so I want to give you an example about how McDonald's did this. Uh, it was about 2004 in the US. I'm telling you about this example because it's a very famous example um, that Harvard talked about a lot and that made this kind of method quite successful. And in the, in the reading list uh, that I'm going to share afterwards, you're going to see a link to a video. I'm not going to show you the video right now. I'm just going to tell you the story behind it. So, um, well, the story behind it is that McDonald's in the US hired consultants and said, how can we increase the sales of milkshakes? We sell milkshakes. We want to increase the sale of milkshakes. And then they used a lot of the traditional user research techniques, like done focus groups, ask people, how can we improve the milkshake so you can buy it more? So you, so you buy in more. And different people said, oh, make it more chocolatey, make it more slurpy, make it bigger, make it smaller, lots of things, often conflicting. And then try to improve the milkshake based on all of that. They launched a new milkshake. The sales didn't change. It wasn't more useful to people. Then they tried a different method. So they realized they, they, they applied the theory. And, and this idea is that people don't actually want a milkshake. What is it that they're actually wanting? So what they did is that a few, a few, of, a few of the consultants behind this, this method spent a whole day outside McDonald's one day from like 7 in the morning to late at night. And they interviewed a lot of people who were walking out of McDonald's. And they also observed what was going on, took lots of notes. And they noticed a few things. One thing they noticed that was a bit weird to them is that in the morning, most milkshakes were bought by people on their own, wearing a suit before 8 a.m. and we're quite in a rush. It's like milkshakes being sold, being bought by people in suits in a rush, who are about to go back to the car. Why? What, how does that make sense? So basically stopped these people and said, what is it? What, try to understand what situation they were in and what is it they were trying to achieve by buying the milkshake. And they realized something. So yeah, understanding the circumstances and struggles. They realized something. All these people in the morning were in a particular, they were, they were buying the milkshake to help them achieve something very particular. So the situation that they were in is that, and I'll give you one example to simplify. They were all in a situation like this. It's 7.50 in the morning. I have a long, boring commute ahead of me where I'm going to be driving for like an hour and a half. I did not have time to get a solid breakfast. I'm not, I know I'm going to be hungry soon. So, I don't know, have you been in a situation a bit like this where you're going to, you know you're going to be bored for two hours and you also know you're going to be hungry and it's not pleasant? You know you want to get rid of that? Well, what they were trying to achieve is not being bored while they're driving and not being hungry before lunchtime. Okay, so what are the different ways that they could use to be, go from this situation to that. Turns out that they were talking about all the other things that they were normally buying when they were not buying a milkshake. And so some people said, well, normally I buy a bagel, but don't, trust me, don't buy a bagel because, because then you're driving and you have your bagel and your bagels are really dry. You need to cut it as you're driving and put something on it. It's a bit dangerous while you do it. Don't do it. It's not a good idea. Some other people said, I, use a donut. I used to use a donut, but again, please trust my advice, don't do it because then my hands get really sticky and I've got my suit and it's quite horrible. I'm not going to buy donuts again. Some people bought bananas in the past, but they said, don't buy bananas. I recommend against it because it's, it's eaten in two minutes and then you're hungry again and you're bored. Nothing to do. Some people use milkshakes. Some people use Snickers. And... Um, what they realized is that the milkshake was the best solution for people in this situation to achieve that outcome. Because the milkshake was perfect, sit in the car, put in the cup holder, uh, it was quite thick, it's got a thin straw, it takes a long time to eat it, and they don't really know what's in it, but it's got little bits, it's quite interesting, and they really don't know what's in it, but they know that two hours later they're not hungry. So what I'm showing you here is that if you really understand the situation someone is in and what they're trying to achieve, it's a bit like, it's a bit like when you play a puzzle and you've got lots of pieces around it and you start to see the, pe the piece in, inside that's going to complete the situation. And you have a much better sense of what is it that's missing, what is it that's going to perfectly fit someone's situation right now. 
So how do you improve it? Uh, well, having learned all this and managed to make it much quicker for people to buy the milkshakes and made it a bit more interesting, like make it a bit sloppier still. But that worked. So yeah, focus on focus on product features makes design hard. But if you, instead, if you understand the situation of struggle people are in and the outcomes they want, that makes design a lot easier. I want to show you very quickly how that applies to something a bit more concrete, like to to a project that I worked on for the Met Office. The Met Office, I, I didn't know when I moved to the country, it's, you know, weather, weather information. And they came to us and they said, uh, we need to make an app. Uh, there are lots of other weather apps out there, but we want our app to be the one that everyone uses. We want, or maybe the most popular one. We want to make the app that's gonna be more popular than all the other ones. How are we gonna do this? So it sounded quite natural to us in the beginning that, well, we looked at all the features that all the other apps are, had. Like, you know, some apps had uh, favorite locations or local forecast summary, or you could customize the app, or lots of other animations and stuff. And we thought, well, surely if our app needs to be the best, it needs to have all the features that everyone else has, plus some more, probably. The problem with this is that it would be impossible, and also it doesn't really give us a sense of direction. We didn't know how to design this thing. We didn't know whether it was gonna work. So instead, we realized people don't want all the best features. That's not what they're after. What is it they're after then? And then we started doing a bit of research, trying to understand the situational struggle people had and, and the outcomes they wanted. And we realized that the, re the, the moment when people were likely to, to use an app, a weather app, is often the, when they're leaving home in the morning and they have no time and they need to decide whether they're going to wear, I don't know, a rain gear or not. And they have no time. So we're really competing against people not checking because they just want to leave immediately. Even quickly checking an app might be too much time. But what we really realized is that a lot of them were gonna, going to be across multiple locations during the day. What I mean by this is different places that might have different types of weather during the day. Like, for example, you wake up in Ilford and you might finish your day in Oxford. And so what do they want? They want to enjoy the day and stay dry and be out of the door immediately. So, you know, then we looked at the, the ways they currently do this, the other apps that help people do this. And we thought, surely, it's not too complicated, right? Surely it should be so instant for someone to just look at something and immediately know whether they should be wearing some wearing gear or not, even if they are across multiple locations. So we looked at what other apps did, and we realized, well, this was Apple's app at the time. It tells you the weather in three different locations, but that's never been useful to me because I only ever managed to be in one location at a time. So if you, if you do want to see the detail of Ilford, you have to click in Ilford, then scroll a bit. You see the detail of Ilford throughout the day. Then remember that in your head. Then come out again. Do the same thing for Oxford. Scroll a bit. Keep it in your head. Compare. It's just too much effort. Doesn't work. People, a lot of people don't use it in the morning. And we realized all the apps were like this as well. They, 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 you needed to um, do lots in order to, to have a clear view of, I'm not going to be rained on today. So the way that we started, the first release of this app had just this, literally just that. It did not have any fancy feature, it just had this, but it was a perfect fit for these people. We're gonna be across several locations during the day and just had to know whether we're gonna be rained on or not. And we did really, really well without having to build tons and tons and tons of things. So this is a more concrete example. So that's re these are really the ideas, I'll recap them at the end. Now I want to, very quickly give you uh, three tips about how to use it. I've got f four or five minutes per tip. Um, great, so tip number one. So tip number one is when you design anything, don't start from feature ideas. And I'm sorry that sounds obvious to you, but I can tell you that it's a habit that, you know, we, I always start with feature ideas. My brain goes like this, and my client's brain go like this as well. And collectively, we always start with feature ideas until we, someone, it could be you, 
stops everyone and says, let's zoom out, guys, or girls, guys and girls. So if the client tells you, we should have a product that's got this and this and this features, then you say, no, 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 we're not starting from feature ideas. Instead of this, my advice is start from the situation of struggle that people are in and the outcomes that they're hoping for. As I mentioned to you. I'm going to give you a quick example of this. So it's about a company called Intercom. They're quite famous in kind of startup world. They, sometimes you go on a website, you do see these things. That's them. Um, so essentially they help startups market themselves to people like you and I. And that's basically it. Um, when they launched, they had a map, a feature that was a map. And you could see, if you're a startup, that you could see where you, all your customers are in the world. And it had quite a lot of features, that map. Quite a lot of features. And they noticed that a lot of people were using this map. So they thought, well, a lot of people are using it, so we should invest more in it. We should make the, app, the map better. So the first brief was, let's make the app, no, let's make the map better. The problem with that brief, starting from a feature idea, is that, well, how should we make the map better? We don't really know, we don't really have a direction. Should we have uh, better border lines? Uh, maybe you could drag to make regions. Maybe you could have more accuracy, better clustering. You could have all that. But, how do we know that any of this is going to be useful? And all of this is very expensive to design and to build. But luckily, these people are smart. And someone said, hang on a second. We're not starting from future ideas. Let's first look at what is it that um, you know, people don't want a better map feature. What is it that people actually want? And they looked at how people were using the existing map. So there's a lots of pictures online of startups, showing off at uh, trade fairs, using the map. They say, look, we are all around the world. And they also saw lots of images online, again, of startup. Here's a, here's a startup called Freckle, who said, look, we're Freckle, and we've got customers all around the world. So they thought, what is it that people are using this map for? And they realized about showing off. And more specifically, because you've got to go quite, quite detailed with this, what was really going on is that, what was going on is that the startups were saying things like, well, our potential investors or potential clients or potential partners, they don't realize how successful we really are. For them, we're just another startup. And it's really hard to convince people to work with us or to invest, to invest in us. And what they were really trying to achieve, they just want potential investors or client partners to, to think they were credible and to want to work with them. They were looking for ways to go from this to this. They could use advertising, they could go to more expos, they could, or maybe they could show Intercom's app and that's what they were doing. Now, if you want to design a better way for someone to go from here to here, you don't need a better map. You just need a better way for someone to go from here to here. And what they ended up with is, an app, is a map that had less features, it was just designed to look good and to be very easy to share. And it was much quicker to design, much quicker to build, and it was a lot more effective. So yeah, don't start from feature ideas, start from the situation of struggle people are in. I'm going to skip the next example, but you're going to have a link to it in the notes at the end, which is the same. People want to do a calendar, let's do a fancy calendar, no, let's not do one. What is it that people want? What they're trying to achieve? They want this to do something much simpler. That was quick. So that was my first tip. Here's the second tip. Here's the second tip, really important. Don't focus on how to be different. And again, this is something that uh, a lot of my clients always do. Okay, we got to differentiate ourselves from our competitors. Surely, if we're the same other competitors, we're not going to be successful. So we got to differentiate ourselves. What could we do that's different from what our competitors are doing? The problem with that is that you could do something that's different from what our competitors are doing, but it might not be valuable at all. So that's not giving you a direction. So instead of doing that, focus on making it easier for people to go from uh, the struggle they're in to the, to the outcome they're hoping for. 
the same diagram. And um, I want to show you concretely how, um, how um, I've done this working for Tesco. So Tesco a few years ago launched an app called Tesco Now. And it's basically like Amazon Prime now, but for groceries. So you could go on your app, say I want these groceries, and get them delivered to you in half an hour. And we're designing this, talking to people would use a kind of a little pilot test thing. I was doing lots of interviews to understand why is it that they were using it. Because honestly, at the time, the delivery fees were eight pounds. I think they're a lot less now. And as I didn't know. I have no idea what people would want to pay so much money to get a delivery that's quick. And a lot of people are saying, oh, I would never pay eight pounds. But turns out they were. So why? What is it? What sort of circumstances people were in that then they were willing to, to do that? Well, it turns out, after talking to lots of people, we realize people are very willing to pay for express delivery, even if it's expensive, when they are entertaining guests. And maybe they're embarrassed because they've forgotten something, or they're tired, or they're drunk, or they feel like in the flow, and so on and so forth. So concretely, these are documents that put together at work. We documented like eight key situations in which people were willing to, to, to use that service. And um, here's one of them. And that situation is, I'm having a party with friends, and we're missing something. I just realized we're missing wine, or we've just run out of wine. Oh. So this is based on real quotes from real people. And then this is how I express that need to people. This is, instead of doing, this is how I do a design brief. I document what someone's need is in terms of what situation they're in and what they're trying to achieve. That's what we start to, that's what we used to start to design. And then what you need to do after that is to understand, okay, well, this, this, need, exists, this need has existed for a long time. People maybe currently go to the grocery store next door or to a small, small, small supermarket next door, why is it that they would want to use something else like Tesco now? So you use this, this diagram to understand what is it they're struggling with currently with the current solution, what they're hoping for with a new one, any anxieties to get in the way, any habits. And that helps you understand why someone might be using your products versus something else. And this is what it looks like for Tesco now. We realized, for example, that one thing that were keeping people that was preventing people from using Tesco now is that they really didn't know what they needed to buy. They needed to be in a store to be inspired, all that sort of things. So yeah, the tip is don't focus on how to be different. Instead, make it easier for people to go from the struggle they're in to the outcome they're hoping for. And the last tip, um, this is also really important <clears throat> and um, a really hard habit to change. Um, when you work as a designer, is don't judge ideas based on how they look or how they sound. Instead, you need to test. And what you need to test is quite objective, actually. You need to test how quickly and easily your ID takes someone from the situation of struggle that they're in to the outcome they're hoping for. Um, I'm going to use a slightly different example for this because I think it's, with the time I have is better. So for example, we're working a few years ago with BP, and they wanted to, um, to, to kind of do innovation in the, in the forecourt, uh, in a, where, people, well, uh, where people take the petrol. And they were like, oh, how can we do something new and exciting in a forecourt? And we, have lots of, we had lots of ideas. What we told them to do is just to make the bloody thing much faster. But that's not really exciting just to make things better, just to make things a bit a better experience. Uh, often it's easier for clients to think, oh, let's do something completely new. That sounds really cool on paper. But we were saying, actually, no, let's not do things new. Let's do things that are, well, we did do things new, but we we're focused on trying to just make the same things better and faster. How do you get people to, 
to agree to do this? Well, you can if you actually not judge ideas on paper, but actually test whether it's actually helping people get from the situation of struggle to the outcomes they want. So concretely, here's how we did it. As I mentioned, it was about helping people in the forecourt, and what we realized is that um, there were lots of customers who were arriving at the petrol station, and they're in a rush. And all they want is to have the car fueled up and to be gone. So how do we help someone who's in a rush and just needs to put some petrol in the car and to be gone? Um, the way we solved this, as I mentioned, our ideas didn't sound grand or particularly impressive on paper. But instead of asking clients to approve them or to buy them, we just tested them. And so concretely what we did is that we, um, we did what we call wizard of oath testing. So we have an app that looks like it's real and functional, but it's actually not. Like the front face of the app is kind of functional, but the brain of the app is actually a human. So in particular, in particular this, is, this person using the app to go to a petrol station and pay and then leave. Now actually, she thought that the app was doing all the clever stuff to pay, but it's actually one of my colleagues was paying in the, in the cashier. But to that, to that person, it was completely transparent. For them, they were using something as if it had already been built. But we could do this in week two of the project as opposed to uh, six months later. And so what we measured is very objective. We measured time on task. How long does it take to someone from the moment that they enter the forecourt to the moment they leave it? Now, the first day, it was too long, and then we changed our designs, and the second day was quicker, and the third day was quicker. And then, if you do this, if you measure concrete real things like this, then you, you have a conversation that's much more objective. And what we also did is, as people were using this thing, we could record them, so you can see the expression, so you have a sense of whether someone is really confused or not. So that's the, that's the last tip. Um, don't judge ideas based on how they look. Test how quickly and easily you know, detect customers from situation struggle to the desired outcome. And the tool that goes with this is that whenever you have an idea, I encourage you, whenever you have an idea, to write it as a hypothesis. So completely you write it as, if we do this, then we believe that this, was ha this is going to happen. And this is why we believe in it. But then you write what test you're going to do to, to see whether that's true or not. And that helps you have, be much more in control of the whole conversation by design. So that's it. Um, I just want to very quickly recap. Can you go backwards, John? I think that's a second picture. Just one second, sorry. I, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a useful one. <laughs> sorry. So to recap, um, key ideas, people don't want products, services, or features. Instead of that, people are in institutional struggle, and they want to get to desired outcomes. And if you focus on the features, it's going to be really hard to design something that helps them out. Instead, you've got to understand the situation of struggle and the outcomes they're hoping for. And the tips that I had for you is don't start from feature ideas, start from situation of struggle and the outcomes. Don't focus on how to be different, but instead focus on how to get people from the struggle they end to the outcome they want. And don't just ideas based on how they look, but test how quickly and easily it gets people from the struggle to the outcome they want. I've got some further reading if you want to get deeper in all these things and, uh, and I skip one of the examples and make sure you can take a picture now um, or, I'll send, or I'll get it across to you. And this is the list I mentioned earlier. And thank you for listening. Um, you now we can talk. Uh, yep, yeah. any question or any thoughts? Uh, can we get a copy of that? Is that a bit cheeky? I don't know. I think. Uh, if that's okay with you, John. I'd like a copy of that. It's really, really useful stuff. Great. Yes, it's, it's possible, yeah. Thank you. It might take me just a bit of time. I won't tidy a few things, but I'll make sure you do. Thanks very much. It's a bit of a silly question. With the um, BP app, did people know they were having their photographs taken? Um, yes, they were. Yeah, they knew that, yeah. It's, they were a research participant, someone that we recruited and... Cool. <laughs>
do you test with like a really big diverse background? Because like you mentioned that it's important, you know, that that it's easy to use for like, disabled people. So, like, is there usually like a budget assigned to this? Like paying people to test your app, like certain people whose opinion really matters to you? Um, so very good question. Um, if you are working for the public sector, um, starting September this year, they are required to make their websites accessible. And next year, they also have to make the apps accessible. Um, that's likely to be enforced. So they will have a budget for it if all goes according to plan. If you work for the private sector, um, it's a lot more common that people might not even, that might not be very much on their radar, or it could be that what we, it could be that it needs some convincing. And, um, and a lot of people don't know how to do it. So as a designer, if you get interested in this, then it can be super helpful, because what I find is that all the designers around me and all the developers around me, where well, the lack is the knowledge. So if you're interested and you start to spread the knowledge, First, your job is going to be way more interesting because you're thinking about a lot more things and uh, everyone, everyone's going to find it useful too. But it does take some convincing uh, sometimes. So, if you have a customer, always he would like to change the idea and change uh, when you test uh, first a draft or uh, first uh, software um, application, uh, how we convince him this is the right one and just uh, because you know you have time scale for uh, managing your uh, uh, stuff, your design. Okay. Yeah. So um, the way that we work or the way that we get paid by clients, we use a method called Agile and concretely, I mean one of the things that it means is that we get paid for our time and that often a client will have a budget and we'll say with that budget we can have a team of 10 people for uh, 20 weeks and it's everyone's responsibility to make sure that we're efficient during these 20 weeks. So if the client is wasting the time, we're really going to encourage them not to do it and help them not to do it, but they really feel it's their responsibility. It's, not, it's, a, it's a shared risk. So this situation I avoid it often. And the other tip is to do what I mentioned, is to do the test. Because if you test, if you know you're going to test an idea rigorously in three days' time, then you don't waste your time debating it for weeks and weeks. Yeah, go on. Um, so clients often know what they want, but they don't know what's good. What would you say is advice for kind of convincing them that what your understanding of what they need is better than what they think they want? Okay. Um, my experience is that my understanding of what the client needs is not better than theirs, or maybe I believe it is, maybe it is a bit better, but it's not better until I've done some research and I've actually put what I believe is right out there, made it concrete and tested with people in a rigorous way. So the way I do it is tip number three, um, test. And then um, my, what I've done in my career is to not be reliant on a researcher being on the team or so I, I made sure I could do that myself and I could do it quickly and effectively enough that my clients just wanted me to do it all the time and also if there's no budget I make it happen anyway I buy 10 pounds of Amazon vouchers and I go to King's Cross test stuff for people there are lots of people you can lots of places you can go in London where you can find people who have five minutes and then when you start doing this people realize that the hypothesis and that the hypothesis were wrong and then they want you to do it more do you find that quite often that they do agree with you or do you find that they kind of go against what you're saying because they still want what they originally wanted? It depends. Uh, I don't struggle with it because clients tend to hire me or, or at least my company tends to put me on projects where the clients know they will need uh, that sort of strategic involvement and uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not particularly good at um, graphic design, so I'm rarely asked to do things kind of, oh, we already know, I just need someone to mock it up or to make it good. And I'm choosing not to be good at it because I'm much more interested in making things use I'm interested in user needs, usability, and accessibility. And if you're really good at it, you'll get to do it. I have a question. Um, 
question that I think might be useful for these guys. What, what, is the, what, what is the average size of projects that you work on, like the average duration, and what is the shortest length or the longest length that you've been able to work on in terms of building the deeper R&D? Um, it really depends. Um, it goes from four weeks to uh, as, as, as long as you like, really. Um, the longest I've spent on a project is about 10 months. I've done that two or three times. I wanted to, sometimes I wanted to move on. It took, it depends. Some projects are like four weeks. It depends. Um, so my company tends to, half, half of the people in my company are engineers. So it's rare that someone hires us just to do the designs or just to do the research. Generally when they hire us, they want us to build the thing. So I like being involved because I, I really find it really interesting to be involved throughout. Um, so if, you, if it's shorter projects, it could be more like just consultancy, that, and then you, you, it stays very abstract, but I prefer it when it's at the same time strategic and concrete, or sometimes when it's short, it's because someone just wants you to get something done, and uh, these are not what I prefer. Some of our colleagues do do that. Um, so yeah, it's a range. You were saying that you have a, like a quite specific, quick research method. It'd be quite interesting to know what that is. Okay, um, it's not a, a research method that's quick. It's just if you if you do something like, for example, usability testing. If you do it three, four times, and you really every time try and really improve it, then you're going to have a system, and, 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 and that system can be very quick and, and efficient. If you want to learn about usability testing, you read this book, Just Enough Research by Erica Hall, and uh, you're going to be ahead of a lot of people in the industry for a long time, just by well, reading it and really trying to apply it. And my, the, it's, what's also helpful is how you think about it, and how I think about it is using what I told you today, um, when I recap, when I tell a, a client about the research findings, I tell them people in these situations trying to achieve these outcomes, uh, try this, struggle to do that, we're frustrated, give up. So it's, if you have a, over the years, you just have a way of thinking about it that makes it quite efficient. There was a question at the back there, yeah? Maybe a question. Um, Or a comment, that's fine. Oh, okay, yeah, that's it. Um, do you, does your company normally have clients who come with an idea and then you produce the idea, or does your company have ideas itself? <laughs> um, we, we work with clients. Uh, we, you had a, we had a couple of times idea of our own, but we were not very consistent in allocating resources to develop it, and we realized our oh, time is much better used working with clients. And these clients, Sometimes they know exactly what they want to do. Sometimes they need help. And we have a mix of both these things. Additional questions, sir. Have you ever had a client come with a nice idea, but they wanted to take it down a route, which you thought, OK, maybe, maybe not. And then you've taken the idea and or shown the idea to someone else and said, this would be a lot. This is what someone's come to us and said, this is pretty Um Yeah. Um, well, I guess, yes, 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 it's happened, it's happened. I'm not sure how much I can say, um, but user testing solved it. Well, actually, I'll tell you why I learned to code. Um, I was working with a very, very big client a few years ago who had been working for months on a concept for an app that, like, millions of people use in the UK. And they had a new concept and they had had like four months just as, des as designers without access to any developers. They had four months to come up with lots of cool ideas that are trying to be innovative. And then we came in to build it. And we really didn't like that idea. We thought it, it wouldn't be impossible to make it accessible, not very intuitive, very different from everything else. Um, and it was, it was a bit difficult. Uh, in the end, uh, Internally, they realized the problem, and they ditched these ideas completely, removed some of the team, and had something that's a lot more standard and that's being very successful right now. So it happens. Um, now, what was really difficult for me is, at, at the time, they were saying, well, this idea, we trust in it because we've tested with 60 people. I knew the researcher, I, knew she's, I, I know she's very good, 
But what I look, what I, what I realized happened is that yes, they were doing lots of research, good methodology of research, but they were always showing prototypes that were not very, very advanced. So they were using things like Marvel or Flinto or sometimes Aksha, and the prototypers were good, but they needed something that had that were more that was more advanced than this because essentially what they're doing is they were because the prototypes you know you had to click exactly at the right place for it to work it's not like a functioning app so they had to tell the user how the prototype worked before showing to the user so the only thing you could then see is whether the user likes it but that's completely rubbish data what you really want to do is to not at all explain the prototype to the user just give them a task and say you're going to use this then shut up then see whether they manage or not. But in order to do this, you need to have a prototype that's functional enough. And that's why I learned to code. Okay, I think... Um, okay, last well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, last very, very question. Very yeah. In yeah. Yeah. Oh, you have a question? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll, we'll take this as the last test and then John is going to stay around for a drink with us. And I yeah. think if there are any further questions, then people can come down. <laughs> That's my question. Not another one. Is that your question? Do you want to go to the pub? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, if that's the question, then that answers it. So, should we, should we come together and thank John for his time and his great lecture?